So um, I've entitled this talk, uh, Chronic Low Back Pain, How to Lift the Fog, because I think actually this is, back pain is a bit more of a difficult subject to sort of wrap your head around something like knee arthritis or um, ACL tears. It's actually a lot of diagnoses likely rolled up into one. And so, you know, as I sat doing my graduate work, I'd often think, why am I doing this? And um, I, hopefully this sort of compilation of slides will sort of help, under, help you understand what um, uh, low back pain is all about. It's a, it's a big topic. Uh, there's a lot of different facets to it. I'll try and sort of paint in broad strokes um, you know, the, the lay of the land. So I'd like to address um, you know, what is low back pain, why is it important, current understanding and guidelines, including um, the model that we use to understand patients with back pain, which is a biopsychosocial model, and then present maybe some points of dissonance uh, with the model as to you know, how surgery and the understanding of, um, has changed the understanding of what we can um, call low back pain and what we can accomplish in patients with low back pain, and then maybe present a path forward. So let's start out with some definitions. Um, back pain is pain between the uh, bottom of the ribs and the top of the buttocks, and um, it, acute is less than three months, and chronic is greater than three months. And that's all there is. And that's really, uh, when you talk about back pain, this is how it's defined, um, and this is part of the big problem, I think. Uh, generally, um, chronic back pain uh, is greater than three months, as I said, and we, uh, in those situations, we really try to exclude red flag conditions, so patients who have cancers and metastatic fractures or osteoporotic fractures or inflammatory diseases. That we try and weed out, and then we're left with what we call mechanical back pain. Now, back pain is a huge problem. It is the number one cause of disability worldwide. And this map uh, is a heat map, sort of demonstrating the, uh, the, the, the incidence of back pain uh, in, in the globe and its related disability. And you can see that we're in yellow, uh, which is uh, amongst the higher grades of disability in Canada. Central Europe is probably the highest, and all depends on what you're reporting and how you're reporting. But the costs related to back pain are tremendous to society. In the US, uh, it's reported around 635 billion. Australia is about 100, uh, 10, uh, 11 billion Australian dollars. So we're somewhere probably in that range. Most of the costs are indirect costs. It's not necessarily that we're treating with surgery. Most of it is, uh, two thirds of it is indirect costs. Medications are included as direct costs, but indirect costs include time off work, um, uh, non-insured services, et cetera. So we try and understand back pain because it's a complex problem using a biopsychosocial model. Let me try and explain to you what I mean by that. So there's a bio part of the biopsychosocial model, which includes structural spinal problems. Um, things like degenerative scoliosis, which is the slide that you see on the left, where with age, the bones, the, the discs degenerate, and you develop a, a curvature in your back. A degenerative spondylolisthesis, which is the middle frame, and if you zoom up on that, you can see that one bone is sliding on, uh, forward upon the other. And this is a, a great source of disability, and one that can be treated very nicely. And lastly, spinal stenosis, where the nerves, which are contained within the spine, get pinched during the uh, degenerative process, uh, causing leg pain and difficulty walking. And overall, you know, these, these causes of low back pain are de-emphasized because it's thought that most patients don't have such structural pathology. It's thought that most patients, we can't identify a cause. Uh, there's a psychologic part of low back pain. How does one um, core, uh, how does one adapt or uh, um, uh, 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 sort of um, how, how do they uh, react to having back pain? And so we're working with a psychologist, a psychiatry group at our group, uh, at our um, institution, and they focus on three main activities. Uh, one is um, that, that can help people cope with back pain. One is catastrophizing. Second is getting people off opiates. And third is increasing their activity. And 
if you enroll such patients, patients with back pain, uh, before or after surgery, we see some major effects uh, on their, uh, we're able to get almost everybody off opioids. You can see on this slide, the top line is morph morphine equivalents. They go from 84 morphine equivalents to zero. And um, I think that's a, that's a huge, huge win. So I think patients who are on opioids with back pain with the right supports, we can get them off. Um, and then we can improve the way they cope with pain, including catastrophizing and um, depression. So I think, um, and then finally, in our institution, we try and apply uh, social. Um, we try and help people who have social um, uh, comorbidities that can help manage back pain. So this can include things like insurance or compensation status, uh, lifting occupations, which can be often injurious. Um, uh, we increase their exercise and general health. But the big point is that you know, this kind of back pain really affects your income. Uh, it can lead you to be off work. You may need to ex incur many out-of-pocket expenses. So using the biopsychosocial model, we can stratify people's risk uh, and help treat them. So uh, in some patients, the biologic part may be the dominant component. So for example, this is a, a patient of mine who had previous surgery uh, and was having agonizing pain and couldn't stand up. Uh, she was, uh, had a stable social situation and no psychological comorbidities. And here, surgery is able to essentially um, uh, get her standing straight and improving her, mobi her mobility. Uh, in other patients, um, it could be that they don't need surgery. They don't, ha they don't have a major structural problem, but it's a psychological component that's uh, the most important. So treatment in this patient, for example, who was a young patient who had a couple of disc herniation surgeries, uh, the main treatment was with our psychologic group. Uh, and she really was able to get help with her catastrophizing by attending the acceptance commitments therapy classes and got a lot of work from the social worker to get stable housing situation. And that may be the dominant uh, forces which helped her with her back pain. So back pain is complicated. You know, there's a lot of um, factors rolled in that will modify one's back pain. Uh, back pain is generally treated in the family practice community, uh, and some of it filters up to surgeons like, like me. Uh, and in the family practice community, uh, there are guidelines on how to treat patients with back pain. And generally, uh, you again, you. This is one example of guidelines. There are Canadian guidelines, there are UK guidelines, the US guidelines. This is the UK guidelines. And generally, um, we try and make sure that there are no red flag conditions, you stratify risk, and don't offer imaging. And that is, um, and then about, at, at over a year follow-up, 20% uh, will still have pain. And those will define as long-term chronic pain. But the, um, generally, uh, it's felt that we don't need to order imaging all the time. So uh, I wonder if it's low back pain nihilism for the, and here's, here's an excerpt from one of the guidelines. Uh, for the mass, vast majority of people with low back pain, it is currently not possible to accurately identify the specific cause of the pain. And this, um, as I think, is what's changing. So I'm going to present now a few examples of patients that we've treated as a group in our place um, who we've helped with back pain, who we think have structural causes of back pain. So this is um, some data from my colleague, Dr. Bouchard, who does lumbar disc replacements. And you can see that um, uh, in two different outcome scores, a visual analog scale, which is a one to 10 sort of stratification, one, one to 10 grading of how bad your back pain is, and a disability index, which uh, describes how one is coping with back pain. Um, surgeries like the lumbar disc replacement in the appropriately selected patient uh, can really help. Uh, they can statistically improve back pain and really improve quality of life. And these are generally in younger patients who have less disc degeneration. Um, I perform adult spinal deformity surgery, and this has changed a lot. 
So what is an adult spinal deformity? Well, um, all of us need to stand straight. And that is the most, if you're, if you're leaning forwards, especially if you're leaning forwards or off to the side, uh, it can really uh, negatively impact your quality of life and make it very difficult to stand and walk. So um, in the last 10, 15 years, this has all been codified and um, brought into routine spine clinical practice. So the point that uh, we have uh, defined patterns of back pain, uh, patterns of, um, of uh, sagittal balance, we'll call it, or patterns uh, by which the spine is shaped that help us stand straight. Uh, we've understood that the pelvis and the spine move together, so the hip and the spine are connected. When you stand, when you stand, this leans forward, and your back adopts a very rounded position. And when you sit, the pelvis leans back, and the spine gets totally straight. That's in health. Uh, in disease, that relationship is gone. So for example, we go back to the slides. This patient's x-rays, um, he's defined as standing like he's sitting. The shape of his spine uh, has not been restored. So this is a very painful condition, and by restoring shapes, we can make patients much better. And by the way, this is the EOS uh, slot scanner that we have on the right, which is um, uh, an imaging device that we have at the McCaig, which allows us to examine shapes. So here's a patient um, that we've treated with uh, degenerative scoliosis uh, in her 70s, and she goes from eight on 10 back pain and eight on 10 leg pain to uh, two on 10 back pain and two on 10 leg pain uh, at two years with a dramatic improvement in quality of life. So these are new technologies that we've employed that help us achieve these surgeries and accomplish them routinely. Um, here are some other types of structural disorders that we can really help with from the surgical realm. Uh, this is what is known as degenerative spinal disease, one bone sliding forward upon the other. And again, this patient at, uh, with a, sh a simple short surgery goes from terrible back pain and a one block walking tolerance to a zero on 10 back pain and one kilometer walking tolerance post-op one year. Uh, the underlying cause of all these uh, disorders that I've presented is likely intervertebral disc degeneration. And the intervertebral disc, uh, and those are some wonderful slides from a gentleman named um, Dr. Rauschnig at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, you can see on the top panel, the disc is, uh, you can see the two bones, the two vertebrae uh, on the left-hand side of that picture, and the disc in the middle, and the nerves in the back. And that is a, a healthy patient. If you look below, that disc is very degenerated, uh, and all of us get disc, disc, disc degeneration. 95% of us will develop disc degeneration by the age of 70. So, um, in general, we have, we have this paradigm here that back pain is a symptom, the way it's generally presented, and not a diagnosis. Uh, and if we contrast that with knee pain, so knee pain, um, if we, when you're young, you can ha have tendonitis. Uh, when you're in your young age, you can get ACL tears or meniscal tears, and as you get older, you can get degenerative arthritis. So they're all different diagnoses. But in back pain, we have not yet codified that to a level that the diagnoses are clear. They're basically into one black box called back pain. So I think that um, how can we look in this box and get more specific diagnoses is through research and through some of the things that we're doing here at this university. Um, we have developed a human spine uh, research infrastructure, including um, a scientific repository that my colleague, Dr. Kadat, will discuss, uh, uh, imaging repository, a tissue bank, and um, a detailed examination of spinal motion through uh, dual fluoroscopy. Um, the other thing I think we can do in Alberta to help uh, standardize or coordinate low back pain care is um, through the work that Dr. Slomp will present um, on uh, the strategic clinical network and how, and Dr. Kocek, and how we can uh, bring together the uh, 
a tremendous number of people that help us uh, identify and treat back pain, which are a whole bunch of family doctors, um, chiropractors, physiotherapists, massage therapists, all of whom maybe some of you have sought care with um, for treatment of back pain. And if we can uh, use a common language to describe patients and share patients across, then maybe we can make a big difference in the treatment of back pain in this province. And so overall, I think that uh, some of the work that we're going to do at, um, at the McKay Institute, including a scientific registry and image analysis, uh, as well as coordinated care options that we can um, develop through the strategic clinical network, could really help us understand low back pain and lead the way in this province. Thank you.